Hello everyone. Now let's continue our discussion for chapter 8, which was about receivables. And uh, we started talking about the write-offs of bad debts. And now we'll see like how the write-offs for, for the bad debts would be recorded uh, using the, the journal entries uh, applying the allowance, the allowance method. And then we'll see like different, different approaches or different methods that can be used uh, to write off um, the bad debts. So when a customer's account is identified as uncollectible, it's written off against the allowance account. Remember, we created this allowance account, which is based on an estimate of uh, our accounts receivable. So um, um, this is like a specific, sometimes it's a specific percentage of accounts receivable or a specific percentage of sales. And we'll talk about that in a second, but I want you to remember that um, the um, allowance for doubtful accounts, it's, it's a contra asset account. So it belongs to assets, but it has an opposite nature, it has a credit balance. So whenever we're using part of it, we're going to debit it now. So this would require a company to remove the specific accounts receivable and an equal amount from the allowance account. Unlike the direct method, in the direct method, we remove the accounts receivable and we record that debt expense uh, right away. In the allowance method, we already recorded the bad debt expense at, at the time we recorded the adjusting entry. But now we're going to use part of the allowance uh, account balance. So on January 21st, uh, year two, John Parker's account of $6,000 with Xstone Company is written off as follows. As you can see here, we are on a, this is just a regular date when we decided to write off the balance for John Parker we're going to debit allowance for doubtful accounts instead of recording bad debt expense in the direct write, direct write off method in the allowance method we're going to debit allowance for doubtful accounts which is the contra asset account that should have a credit balance and we credit accounts receivable and by crediting the accounts receivable we, we're canceling the balance for the accounts receivable for John Parker so as you can see here both under assets uh, one is debited the allowance for doubtful accounts it's a contra asset account that has a credit nature we're reducing it so it's going to be debited, and we are also reducing the accounts receivable for John Parker. Nothing is affecting liabilities or stockholders' equity in this case. So at the end of the period, allowance for doubtful accounts would normally have a balance. Um, the balance can be a debit or credit balance. We'll end up having a credit balance if the amount of actual write-offs were less than what we estimated. But we might end up having a debit balance, and this could happen if we experience more right bad debts, bad debts than we actually anticipated. So, <clears throat> again, as it says here, there should be a balance, and the balance exists because there's no way we can actually meet, or actually it's a very low chance that we can meet uh, an amount of actual bad debt that is exactly equal to our estimate. So as it says here, this is because allowance for doubtful accounts is based on an estimate. As a result, the total write-offs to the, to the uh, allowance account during the period will rarely equal the balance of the account at the beginning of the period. Um, they're using the term rarely, but in reality, it's, it's almost impossible. Like uh, We estimate like $30,000 to be bad debt, but it might be thirty two, might be twenty nine. To have it exactly $30,000, the, the chances are very low. So the allowance account will have a credit balance at the end of the period if the write-offs during the period are less than the beginning balance. So if we had $30,000 in allowance and we end up like canceling or writing off, let's say, 28, so we'll still have $2,000 on the credit side. It will have a debit balance on the other side if the write-offs exceed the beginning balance. So let's say we made an estimate of 30 but our, our actual write-offs turn out to be 33. Then in this case, we'll, have, we'll end up having a debit balance. And this has to be um, like recovered in the next time we made an estimate. So <coughs> you can think of the uh, allowance for doubtful accounts as a bucket. Uh, the account for allowance for doubtful accounts is like a bucket, where the adjusting entry would fill the bucket with our estimate. And then the adjusting entry, um, again, it fills the bucket, and then the writing off the account empties the bucket. Uh, of course, in, in reality, we cannot empty the bucket 
with more than what's in the bucket. But in, in the allowance method, sometimes this can happen. We, 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 might, end, we might have a $30,000 um, based on our adjusting entry, but we end up uh, like emptying 32. Again, this is possible. Uh, but even though in reality this is like if we're using the bucket example, it's not really uh, perfect in this case. So let's see an example. Assume that during year two, Exton Company write off $26,750 of the uncollectible accounts, including the $6,000 account of John Parker uh, recorded on January 21st, year two. So the allowance for deductible account would have a credit balance of $32,50. How did we get this balance? Remember, we estimated it to be $30,000. The actual was ended up to be twenty six seven fifty, so our ending balance is a credit balance of three to three two fifty, or three thousand two fifty. So let's see this on the T account. Here we have a T account for the allowance for doubtful accounts. We credited the balance at the very beginning, based on the adjusting entry that we made in year one, for thirty thousand, and then these are the all the write offs. They added up to be twenty six seven fifty, so our ending balance is a credit of three two fifty. If X Stone has written off more than the 30,000, which is 32,100, in accounts receivable during the second year, the allowance for doubtful accounts would have a debit balance of 2,100. So this is the case where we actually uh, empty the bucket with more than it had, like what's included in it. So the allowance for doubtful accounts here started with 30,000. We, we had more write-offs, which ended up to be 32,100 on the debit side. So that would lead to a debit balance for the allowance for deductible accounts of 2100. So the allowance account balance, credit balance of 3250 and the debit balance of 2100 in the preceding example are before the end of period adjusting entry. Because remember, we're going to do another adjusting entry to bring the balance up again. So after the end of the period adjusting entry is recorded, allowance for deductible accounts should always have a credit balance. An account receivable that has been written off against the allowance account may be collected later. Uh, like the direct write-off method, the account is reinstated by an entry that reversed the write-off entry. The cash received in payment is then recorded as a receipt on account. So again, let's see an example for uh, this situation. So assume that Nancy Smith account of 5000 which was written off on April 2nd of year 2, is now collected. So on June 10th. So after a couple of months, she decided to, uh, to pay her balance. Exton Company journalizes their in statement and the collection as follows. So we'll do the exact same, that, same thing that we've done for the direct method. So we're going to reverse the, the write off entry and then we record the collection. So as you can see here, on June 10th, we reversed the write off entry. We debited accounts receivable one more time for Nancy Smith. And we credited allowance for doubtful accounts. So if we go back to see how the this this journal entry looked like, we debited the allowance for doubtful accounts, and then we credited accounts receivable. Now we're reversing that. So we are debiting the accounts receivable, and we are crediting the allowance for doubtful accounts. <clears throat> and that's of course for Nancy Smith. And now we're going to col to collect the cash from her. So we debit the cash, and we credit accounts receivable one more time. So this way, we're going to have uh, the accounts receivable, actually, if you think about it, it's, it's been canceling each other. But uh, we debited cash and we credited allowance for doubtful accounts. But it's better to present it in two journal entries, so that would clarify the reinstatement and then the collection process. Now let's talk about an important part of, of this process, which is estimating the uncollectibles. So the allowance method requires an estimate of uncollectible accounts at the end of the period. This estimate of current unexpected or ex I mean current expected credit losses is normally based on past experiences, uh, industry averages, current economic conditions, and forecasts of the future. The two methods used to estimate uncollectible accounts are the percentage of sales method or analysis of receivable method. So the first one we call it the income statement approach because sales are technically part of the income statement. The other approach we call it, or the other method we call it the balance sheet approach because it's based on the receivables and receivables are technically part of 
the balance sheet. So let's start with the percentage of sales method. I think it's easy, very straightforward. So since accounts receivable are created by credit sales, uncollectible accounts can be estimated as a percentage of credit sales. So the portion of credit sales to sales is relatively constant. The percentage may be applied to total sales. So assume the following data for x -Town Company on December 31st, year 2, before any adjustments. We have a beginning balance of accounts receivable of 240000 We have a balance of allowance for doubtful accounts, 3250, and that's that's remaining from last year. The total credit sales is 3 million, and the bad debt as a percentage of credit, credit sales is three quarter of a percent of one percent. So in this case it's very straightforward. We're just going to take the three quarter of one percent multiplied by three million, whatever this amount is going to be used for the adjusting entry. So as you can see here. We're going to calculate the bad debt expense of 22500 and how did we get it? Again, the amount of credit sales, the 3 million, multiplied by 3 quarter of a percent. Make sure that you multiply this correctly. This is 0.75 percent. Okay, it's not 75 percent. It's 0.75 percent and that's equal to $22,500. So the adjusting entry would use directly the amount of the bad debt expense we calculated. So we debit bad debt expense for 225 we credit allowance for doubtful accounts for 225, which is exactly what we've done before in, in our uh, 30,000. So the journal entry is the same. So the only th new thing now is how we got the 22,500, which is again a percentage of sales. <clears throat> so after the adjusting entry is posted to the ledger, bad debt expense would have an adjusted balance of 225. The allowance for doubtful accounts would have an adjusted balance of 25750 How did we get this value? It's the 3250 that was the unadjusted balance at the end of year 2, plus the adjusting entry that we just made, <clears throat> and that would lead to an adjusted balance of 25750 So the under, under the percentage of sales method, the amount of the adjusting entry is the amount estimated for bad debt expense. This estimate is credited to whatever the unadjusted balance is for allowance for doubtful accounts. So the, the good thing about the percent of sales method or percentage of sales method is that you don't need to do a lot of calculations. You just take the percentage, multiply it by the credit sales, whatever number you get, you plug it in in the, in the adjusting entry. And it's that simple. Things are slightly different in the analysis of receivable method, and we'll see how it works. So the analysis of receivable method is based on the assumption that the longer an account receivable is outstanding, the less likely it will be collected. It makes sense. If we have a debt that has been outstanding for a long time, the chances of being able to collect it is going to be lower and lower. So the analysis would work as follows. The first step, the due date of each account receivable is determined. Then the number of days each account is past due is determined. This is the number of days between the due date of the account and the date of the analysis. And then each account is placed in an H class according to its days past due. Typically, H classes include the following. So things like no past due, if it's still not, not too late, uh, 1 to 30 days past due, 31 to 60, 61 to 90, 91 to 180, 180 to 365, which is a year, like six months to a year, and then over a year, or over 365 days. And then in step four, the total of each H class are determined. And then the total for each H class is multiplied by an estimated percentage of uncollectible accounts for that class. These percentages, by the way, are given to you. They're not going to be, uh, it's, there is no standard for it. It's not something that you have to follow a specific percentage. Every business would decide on what the percentage to be used. And then in the last step, the estimated total of uncollectible accounts is determined as the sum of uncollectible accounts for each aged class. So the preceding steps are summarized in an aging schedule, and this overall process is called aging the receivables. And we'll see it in the next slide, we'll see the table for that. So let's assume that Exxon Company uses the analysis of receivable method instead of the percentage of sales method that we just presented earlier. So Exton prepared an aging schedule for its accounts receivable of 240,000 as of December 31st, year two. Remember, they had accounts receivable of 240,000. Their aging schedule would look as follows. 
<clears throat> we have all the name of our credit customers and of course here we skipped some lines so we went from line 6 all the way to 22 and here's the total 240,000 and of course we have each customer with their balance and then you can see that <clears throat> for example customer broke company uh, the $4,700 is still not past due so the due date for them did not um, come yet uh, we have for Ashby and Company 1500 these are um, more than a month but less than two months for BT Bar there are more than one balance one balance is over three months but less than six months and another balance is over six months but less than a year so at the very end we just add each column how much is not past due how much is within a month two months three months six months a year and then over a year and then we get all these balances and then we allocate the percentage as you can see here two percent five percent ten percent twenty thirty fifty and eighty and again, as you can see, the longer the past due date, the, the higher the chance that the, the debt is not going to be collected. So, for example, if something is over a year, 80% we're not going to be able to collect it. But if it's not past due, 2% is not going to be collected. That's based on our estimate. <clears throat> so, again, this is not going to be based on a standard or anything like that. This is what the company decides on doing and usually in problems it's going to be given to you so you take this percentage multiplied by their balance for each category and you get them all together here and then add them up to be 26,490 so our estimate of our of uncollectible accounts for the 240,000 is going to be 26,490 the 26,490 is the total of all these values here okay so <clears throat> the, the process works as follows. We, we get these values, multiply by the percentages, get these numbers, add them up, add them up all together to get the 26,490. <clears throat> so the sum of the estimated uncollectible accounts for each H class, which is in step 6, is the estimated uncollectible account on December 31st of year 2. This is the desired adjusted balance for allowance for doubtful accounts. And I want to stress on the word desired. Okay, this is not the amount we're going to use right away on the adjusting, adjusting entry. This is the amount we want our allowance for doubtful accounts to be. That's why we call it the desired. So whatever balance we have, we're going to adjust it to reach the desired balance. So comparing the estimate with the unadjusted balance of the allowance accounts determines the amount of the adjustment for bad debt expense. So let's see this on the example. <clears throat> So for X stone, the unadjusted balance of the allowance account is a credit balance of 3250. The desired balance, remember, was 26,490. Okay, that's the desired balance. We already have a balance of 3250. So the amount to be added to the balance and be used in the adjusting entry would be the 23,240, which is the desired balance minus the existing credit balance. So then we record just a regular uh, adjusting entry where we debit debt, debt expense, and credit allowance for doubtful accounts. <clears throat> just a little tip here. What if this was a debit balance? If this is a debit balance and the desired balance is 26,490, then we have to add the debit balance to the desired balance. And then in this case, it's going to be um, 29,000 and some fraction. So. The thing I want to remember, you have to always check what is the existing balance that we already have and what is our desired balance. So if the, uh, if the existing balance is credit, then in this case we subtract the desired, like we get the desired and we deduct from it the, the existing credit balance. But if the existing balance is debit, then we get the desired balance and we add to it the, the existing debit balance. So please remember that. And then we plug in the value into the traditional kind of um, adjusting entry at year end where we debit the bad debt expense and we credit the allowance for doubtful accounts. So after the preceding adjusting entry is posted to the ledger, bad debt expense would have an adjusting balance of 23,240. And as you can see here, this is our adjusting entry. <clears throat> and our, our ending balance would be the desired balance that we calculated. 
Um, the net realizable value would be 213,510, which is our accounts receivable balance minus the, the account, the accumulated, uh, or I mean minus the allowance for doubtful accounts, which is the 26,490. So under the analysis of receivable method, the amount of the adjusting entry is the amount that will yield an adjusted balance for allowance for doubtful accounts equal to the estimated to that estimated by the aging scale. And that's the main uh, idea here. So let me stop here. In the next video, we're going to continue our discussion. Thank you.